Hello everyone and welcome to this week's edition of the Village Law SEQFC preview show. I'm Daryl Lutton and we're doing the Gold Coast show first, which is a, a first. We've never done it in that order there before. It's always generally the last show we do it on Thursday. We thought we'd mix it up and go Wednesday. So we've got some guests to accommodate. We've got Mark Madge from Gold Coast Football. G'day Mark. Darren, how are you going? Good. Great to see your face again after what's about five weeks off now. Yeah, I had a couple of weeks before the lockdown off as well. And now I'm back. So again, thank you for having me back and it's good to be back. <laughs> it's no show without you, mate. Let's be honest. We've got uh, Brett Budley from Palm Beach. G'day. Hey, oh, guys. You're not wearing a city kit this week. What's going on there? I couldn't find it. It's in the wash. I've been wearing it that much lately. It's a bit dirty, so. <laughs> and we've got Alex Thelwall, who's the technical director at Twid United. G'day, Alex. Welcome. Newbie. Hey, Darren. Hey, hey, hey you go, mate. Thanks for having me on. Good, mate. Cool. Uh, this camera angle, you've got some guns going on there, mate. Are you a, well, are you a personal cool. trainer or what? <laughs> no, I just was a retired footballer for a while, so, um, yeah. Decided to take up gym for a few years, but I think <laughs> I have to pull my sleeves down a little bit. Mate, yeah, show them off, show them off. You've got it going on. Anyway, from that homoerotic start, let's get cracking. <laughs> <laughs> so we had some games on the weekend, Mark. I'll get you to take us through the results and what it all means. Uh, yes, let's start so with the Premier League, of course. Uh, yep, so we'll go with the Premier League. Uh, we'll start at surface. Lex Bell, 30 o'clock. Um, it was 45 seconds into the game and surface scored, as everyone who knows follows the Gold Coast Premier League. Once they take into the deep end and get a goal early, it, it's good night. Um, they, they, you know, score in bunches, and that's what they did against Runaway Bay. Uh, the game was basically done, um, you know, shortly after, and at 15, 20 minutes in, it was 5-0, um, and that was basically burners off. and. You know, let's let's start keeping the ball and, and and keeping possession. And you know, as Alex and Brad and everyone knows in football, once you get to that such a hot start, um, it's very rare that you continue to press on and keep scoring the amount of goals. Credit to Runaway Bay, though. I mean, they didn't give up uh, for 90 minutes. They kept battling in the second 45. They held it to 2-1, um, finishing 7-1 in the game. So you know, it's very easy for a side like that to just you know a lot of things aren't going your way in the season, just to um, you know give up. Um, and it could have been a whitewash, but, you know, they held strong. Um, they were missing a few players as well, no excuses. I mean, um, I'm sure Nathan won't dwell on the players missed, but, you know, some key players, especially, you know, Luke Whitted up front, their number nine, who can hold the ball up, their, their midfielder, Matt Madeley, who can throw a ball. I, I think if you had a competition for someone who can throw the ball the furthest in southeast Queensland, he would win by country mile. Um, because I can see, I've seen, and Brett can attest to that, he can throw a ball in from halfway. Um, into the box. So, um, you know, a couple of those players missing, but uh, on the other hand, surface uh, back to full strength. They welcome back, you know, Dean Wernerson from a long injury, um, who's a great player on the Gold Coast here, centre back, and Brandon Gomez after his MCL tear. Um, he's back as well after four months. So, definitely, definitely good signs for them. Narang, again, Rabina, um, you know, it's a very, very tough season for Rabina, and he got tougher on, on the weekend, 8 1 loss there. Uh, you know, we weren't at that game, but it seemed like it was a pretty, you know, you're looking at the lineups, Narang went all out, pushed forward, um, created plenty of chances, you know, scored eight goals in the process. Just a point to mention, we gave him a shout out in the Gold Coast Bulletin. I think a lot of people know his, his value is Trent Barwick got on the score sheet again. Um, he scored 10 goals for Rabina um, this season, which, you know, is an unbelievable achievement considering you know, the personnel and other players around him uh, to score 10 goals, uh, you know, is it, hard in our league. You look at the players that have only scored above 10 goals. Um, a lot of teams competing, you look at the rank, they're competing for a league title and their top score has got 11 goals. So it so shows- he scored 10 out of 15. Yeah, um, he scored 10 goals, free kicks, uh, like belters, not just tap-ins, he's actually had to score those goals. So. A fantastic season for him personally, if you want, if you can call it a fantastic year. Um, I'll let Brett talk about his game, but I'll, I'll summarise the Sunday game. Um, Southport Musgrave, 6-3. It was goals, goals, goals in the Gold Coast Premier League. And a lot of those were mistakes uh, made by both teams. So Rust definitely on show. There was three all with half an hour to go. Um, it was hanging there in the balance a little bit. But then, um, you know, eventually... 
uh, Southport, again, that front two. I've been talking about it all year. Everyone knows Ferdy and Morgan, you know, a hat-trick for Ferdy, um, Anor and, and a double for Morgan. So, um, you know, that's unfortunately their last game of the regular season, um, which means they'll have a couple of weeks off before they have to host the first leg of their final, semi-final, sorry, against first. Um, but again, yeah, it's you can look at it two ways. You know, I think this is a, a situation though where rest won't come in handy um, for Steve and his side. You know, we say rest versus rust, but having one game in eight weeks is definitely not not the rest you want. Butters, take us through your two-one win over Burley. Ah, uh, yeah, um, tough game. We knew we knew it was going to be tough against the, uh, any Philae side is is fit and up for it. Um, I thought we had the better of the running for most of the game. Uh, they've obviously got people that you know, are dangerous, but um, they scored just before half time from a, a corner. Um, and then, you know, we tried to regroup and we we're pretty confident at half time that we could get something out of the game. Um, then we scored, I think it was marked with about 10 to go. Yep. And then we, we, you know, put on the pressure, put everyone forward, lift one at the back sort of thing. And, and we got the, the goal in the 95th or 94th minute or something. Um, you know, it's pretty rare that my team's ever, that's ever happened to me as a coach, usually happens against me. Uh, but, you know, I said to the boys after the game, that, that pure emotion you get when you score or when you win in the last minute of the game, that, that, that's the priceless commodity of football. You know what I mean? It happens very, very rare, but it's, it's the highest of emotions. It was really good. Do you remember what you did? How you reacted? Yeah, sort of. I'm hoping Mon Bailey didn't take any photos of it. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty sure I'd done a bit of a Ross Fennick type of thing. But, um, yeah, I, I hope she doesn't have any photos. But I, I, I definitely looked over to Philo afterwards in that moment because I've, I've been in that situation. I sort of felt for a bit there as well, you know. All right. Now, there is, of course, one result that you didn't mention, Mark, and that was the match against Kingscliff and Broadbeach. Alex, I'm going to bring you into this now. Alex uh, from Tweed United. Kingscliff, Tweed United, both New South Wales clubs in the middle of a pandemic. Alex, what's going on? What can you do? So... Currently, at the moment, we're having to field a squad of just Queensland-based players only. So... You know, for us, it's a mixture of Coast League, Coast League Reserves, a couple of Metro boys. I've even got one or two of our under-18s in there. So we can't train at home. We're currently training at Rabina. So Kingsliff are obviously in the same predicament. Um, but from what I can see, they weren't able to field a team on the weekend. They didn't have enough players, you know, to make it, make it, make it happen. But, yeah, so we're all in a bit of a, the same sort of predicament there. But we just got to do what we've got to do, I guess. So. All right. So, Mark, extraordinary times here. What uh, what decision has Football Gold Coast made? Uh, yep. So, um, on that note, I think Kingsliff notified Football Gold Coast they won't be able to field teams um, at this current border situation. So, uh, the decision's been made across the board as well. Um, I don't know, you mentioned the two senior clubs, but also, you know, we've got Mwollomba and Balambal also over the border. And if you look at the JPL divisions, the young and up-and-coming players, um, a lot of those leagues are led by Mwollomba. Um, so, you know, the Liverpool Academy players um, from Southern Cross that used to be in Southern Cross and Lismore, they're now back in the fold. Um, so the decision's been made that, uh, you know, nil all draws uh, have been awarded for all games that cannot be played between Queensland and New South Wales teams. Um, as, you know, it's not fair for the New South Wales teams um, who are there or thereabouts or like, you know, Tweed Reserves won the league. Um, there was no other way that Football Gold Coast could determine a fairer outcome for these games. Um, than to give nil all draws. It also allows that, you know, I know it, it's wishful thinking, but if that border was to suddenly open um, with two, three weeks left in the competition, especially more the junior side, that those teams could come straight back in and continue playing. Now, very unlikely. I think we can all agree that it would be very unlikely for that community sport to just be allowed to return as per normal, especially with um, Northern New South Wales still being locked down um, in, in, their, in their positions. So, yeah, it's, it's tough. It was a tough decision for Football Gold Coast. There's a lot of moving parts, a lot of conversations, a lot of discussions around what those outcomes should be. Um, ultimately, they, it was narrowed down to six choices, um, six different options, and the option with the nil-all draw um, was chosen. 
All right. Now, just to back up that decision, I should add that uh, football southwest, so uh, matches in Toowoomba, uh, they have one club, Gatton Redbacks, who are in the in the Lockyer Valley. So they were subject to to lockdown, whilst all the teams on the Darling Downs were all free to play. So they played out the season, but any team having to play the Gatton Redbacks got a nil-all draw. So mm. there's precedent for that decision. So, um, yeah, I don't have any issues with it. Guys, what do you think? You okay with it? Breath reserves are. Oh, yeah, no, I'm, we're, we're good with it. Obviously, you know, feel, feel for Kingscliff sort of thing. And Alex? Yeah, obviously it's um, not ideal. Um, all our reserve grade work that all they cared about was keeping their undefeated record, so they're stoked. But um, <laughs> I get, I guess for um, you know our coast league, you know, it's it's worked for us. We're able to still field a team. Um, but yeah, obviously, you know, for for teams playing Kingscliff that may have probably got the three points, maybe not now, which could be affecting finals. So. I guess there's no perfect way to do it. You're going to be upsetting someone no matter which way you do, but at least there's sort of, you know, like you said, there is precedence and I guess it's probably the fairest outcome for everyone. Mark, just looking at the ladder with, with Kingscliff in fifth on 24 points, Palm Beach in fourth on 32, with only two games left, it, it's immaterial because no one could have, could have, made their way into the top four, there could have been no changes there. Was it just a, a matter of uh, positioning on the ladder? Basically, yeah. So with a current finals format, um, you know, in this aspect, in the Premier League specifically, um, you know, it affects Southport. They were the ones left to play Kingscliff. Now, right. ultimately, if you look at it um, and the way that Palm Beach have been playing, it's pretty, uh, pretty likely that, you know, the final standings would remain as they are with Southport um, being slotted in the fourth place and Palm Beach probably, Palm Beach probably edging just some goal difference because um, they wanted to end up on equal points um, if you look at it from that perspective. So, um, again, you know, the hard, the hard part is when you, when you consider these situations um, and, and going and projecting forward, you could play this scenario out a million times. It would never happen. But what, what would be the situation if Narang and Surface both dropped points in two out of their three games and drew, the, and drew their remaining game and Southport were to win all three games and win the league. That, that, that's it. You could play it a million times. It would never happen. And I don't mean to sound ridiculous or Palm Beach for that matter. Um, you could play it a million times and it wouldn't happen. Uh, I can safely say that that outcome would never happen. But, you know, that's just one, one division. If you look at reserves now, um, you know, Burley and Broad Beach and Palm Beach are all in a battle for that final fourth spot in reserve grade. And, you know, because... Uh, Burley and Broadbeach, uh, the randomised draw put them to play Kingscliff in the final couple of games, won't have a chance to get three points. Now, those two, those two first grade teams are out of finals contention. So those fringe players might not sit as a fresh sub anymore. They might play in that reserve grade game. So as you, know, as you said, it benefits some, disadvantages the other. So you know, it was just a, a matter of trying to find a, a reasonable outcome for the whole Gold Coast. It's unforeseen circumstances at the end of the day. Um, we've never had to deal with anything like this. Uh, we'll learn. I'm sure we'll learn from this and have something, you know, in place moving forward. Um, with, you know, under Football Queensland, that will be. So, you know, th their, their selection, their, their suggested choice was not the same as ours. Um, you know, I won't go into detail what their preference was, um, but I can say that it wasn't exactly what the, what the fairest outcome that Football Gold Coast came up with. All right. Let's have a look at this weekend's fixtures then. Now, is there still some a couple of catch-up games that from earlier rounds that need to be played? In the Premier League, no. Uh, we're fully up to date. In the Coast League, yes. There's still a couple more outstanding games. Um, Coast League did okay. play last week, so as well. Um, I'm looking at the ladder, though, and I only see two teams on 17, with 17 matches played. Uh, that's in the Premier League? Yes. Yeah, so we have one full round this week, yep. um, minus the Kingsley fixture, and then we have three games left in the final round because Southport Rabin has been played. So you could call that a catch-up round. That's lockdown weekend where we played Friday night and we missed out Saturday, Sunday, and one of those games is Kingsley Burley. Right. That's the, that's the week that is 
the blockbuster weekend realistically um, in, the, in that last day. And are they being played next weekend or midweek? They're next weekend. Next, next week. weekend. All right. So we'll do a show next week. Yeah. Very good. Let's get to uh, this weekend's fixtures then. So, of course, Kingscliff and Southport is going to be a nil little draw for all you punters. Get on it. Guaranteed. <laughs> Broad Beach taking on Surface Paradise. Burley Heads taking on Rabina. Runaway Bay up against Narang and Musgrave against Palm Beach. Run through them, Mark. It, it's it, with the extended break that we've had there uh, was sort of thinking maybe we'd get a few upsets here and there but it was just you know just all st- according to plan so will that occur yeah. again this weekend look the top two uh have a difficult trips um broad beach at 10 past eight at night always a difficult at broad beach um you know they always they always you know are, are resilient no matter what the situation is like i said their reserve grade game means more so i wouldn't be surprised if a lot of those you know fringe players sort of help out their res in that aspect um and then you know the first grade definitely surface will be going there with one objective that's to get all three points and make sure they put themselves in the position they need to heading into the final round um it'll be tough but you know considering that they've got all their players back um and they're, they're rolling um you know you expect surface to come away on top the Rang and Runaway Bay is going to be in a, a similar scenario. You know, it's tricky to go to Bay. Um, you look at their results, especially at home. You know, Palm Beach uh, kick. I think they, I believe they kicked off their winning streak um, that they've been on at Bay. Uh, you know, the one 0 win there, so it was, it was tough for them. Surface had a tough game there; couldn't couldn't break them down. So, depending on what Bay uh, rocks up, final home game of the year um, for Runaway Bay, I believe. So, you know, even more there um, to give them more. A bit more energy, the, lo- the local support there. They've got a big day, Coast League there as well b- beforehand. So, you know, tricky test for sure. Uh, one point worth mentioning is obviously Narang um, have three players who have gone overseas to college football in America. Um, Michael Rusakis, Ethan Towers, Henry Adams, all key pieces for them um, in this run for the league title. Um, you know, all three have done their own part, but I think the Michael Rusakis loss is one, a huge one. Um, he, was, he was huge for them in defence all season and had a great combination with Leon Bell. So again, you expect them to get the job done to set up, um, you know, a fantastic final day. Burley Rabina, you know, I thought, you know, my comments on Burley's game against Palm Beach we went with both coaches there was that that was Burley's best performance of the year. Um, I thought that they, they put in their best 90 minutes of football, had a bit of lapses in concentration, but again, Palm Beach's um, attacking side and a lot of possession that they had you know, it was always going to always the door was always going to um, open eventually for them. Um, but again, you know, against Rabina, anything could happen. It'll be free flowing. Both sides have nothing to lose. This is the last game for both those teams, with Rabina playing their Southport game, and Burley obviously playing um, their the Kingscliff the week after. So uh, an, another definite great great game. And Musgrave Runaway Bay. I mean, Brett knows the threats that Musgrave have. Um, you know, it's pretty pretty evident they got. You know, players in, in the front third and in the midfield that can that can hurt you if they get going. Um, but the role that Palm Beach is on, I think they, that game against Burley is the perfect thing what they needed to edge into this next part uh, of the season. And now, you know, Musgrave, Runaway Bay, you expect them to pick up uh, six points um, and roll into the finals. Brett, I'll ask you this first. With Narang losing those three players, is that their season cooked? Do they have adequate backup for those guys? Yeah, I think they do their... Um... Reserve grade at top of the league, I'm pretty sure. Um, they've definitely they've definitely got the depth. Whether they can continue in both both divisions, first grade and reserve grade, yet to be seen. Uh, but they're three, you know, three of their best players, three of their most exciting players. Um, I'm I'm happy they're gone. Um, <laughs> but you know, in saying that, we we beat them four one up there on a Tuesday night with all those three players in there. So. You know, it doesn't really matter to us. We, we beat anyone. What's your take on it, Mark? Look, those players, like I said, the, the three players will definitely make a difference. I think they've got, you know, like sort of Caleb Murphy, um, who was a great player last year when he was, before he broke his foot, got injured again this year, had some injury setbacks. But he's now uh, back in and, and firing on all cylinders. Um, they have got enough depth and experience there um, to, to cover that. Uh, it's just a matter of, as Brett said, can they adjust in the final couple of games? Um, and again, you know, it's all about repetition, isn't it? Um, when you play consistently with the same squad and, and those three players didn't miss a game. So they were, they were, and Henry Adams, 
apart going into the weekend was their top scorer until Robbo scored a double and is now equal with him on 11 goals. So, you know, you lose your top scorer. For me, one of the best defenders we've had this year on the Gold Coast in Michael Rusakis has had a fantastic season. Um, and Ethan Taos' athleticism and, and just strength has been huge for them in that, in that right back role. Um, so tough losses, but again, I've seen this um, script many a time with Lee Vernon's teams in Broadbeach that it doesn't matter who you put in there. They just, it's like a glove, just changing hands. Um, and I think, you know, I actually think they're probably better equipped now um, with the, as, as Brett says, with the depth and the players at their disposal um, to cover, to cover those losses. The biggest one will be Michael Rusakis at the back. Um, defenders aren't easy to find and to slot straight in and perform. Attacking-wise, a bit easier to replace. All right. Before we uh, talk about this uh, this break, enforced break that we've had, I want to talk about the Coast League. The Looking at this week's fixtures, Alex, that's just a remarkable situation, having to, to pull a team together from, uh, from all your juniors. You're taking on legends this week who are in second place. How are you going to uh, how are you going to get this side up and running and compete? So um, we've kind of been lucky. Um, Nathan Mulhern at Rabina's um, sort of let us train with them the last sort of fortnight. So we've been at their venue. Um, he actually was an old assistant coach at Tweed a few years ago before he went to Rabina. So you know, he does know a bit of the squad. Um, but yeah, we've sort of been lucky there. Um, I guess we just sort of got a call upon. We're lucky. Probably the core group of our squad is, you know, 30 plus. So, you know, they've got a lot of experience. We're sort of hoping that's going to, you know, carry us through. But at the same time, we have no coaching staff. All our coaching staff are in New South Wales. So we've sort of got our captain and a couple of senior players have gotten together and, and we're sort of, you know, trying to coach ourselves. But, yeah, I guess we've just got to roll the sleeves up and try to get three points each week. You know, we only need... Need. hopefully two wins will get us I think two wins secures us a, a top four spot for sure but hopefully just one one out of the three will, will get us into the, the top four and you, know, you never know what can happen one three and a four Alex, when you said, sorry, sorry, go ahead. Alex when you said you were training together like training next to each other or both squads together no we've actually um, actually trained with them this week wow. um, which was really nice and Nathan and same time obviously you know Rabina haven't had you know the season that they they wanted so I guess to have, you know, 15 players or, or I think we only had 10 to be fair this week, but jump into their session, freshen them up a little bit. I think I think it was really good for them as well, you know, especially yeah. with them not really having a whole lot to play for at the moment. Trish, I hope they let you train there next week. What was that? Sorry? I hope they let you train there next week. <laughs> I, hope, I hope so too. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a great option. All right. So looking at this weekend's fixtures, we've got Talabadra up against Musgrave. Uh, Runaway Bay taking on Ormo. Narang, Pacific Pines, as we mentioned, Legends taking on Tweed United. Palm Beach up against Tambourine Mountain. Mudrabar have the bye. Looking at the ladder, this is done, right? Talabadra are champs. Is that correct, Mark? Trophy's getting down to Coplex on Friday night. I'll be there to present. Um, a team that 10, 15 years ago would rival the Premier League's top. <laughs> um, not they can't play now, but uh, yeah, they'll, they'll be receiving their trophy um, on Friday night. Excellent. Well, it's good to see someone at Complex getting a trophy anyway, hey? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So with these remaining fixtures, um, with with the this league, are there, are there any issues? I mean, we've got the Tweed United situation sorted with the, the, the put together team. Are we going to get these remaining fixtures all done? Uh, I believe that the only one of this situation taking Tweed out is the Runaway Bay Reserves Coast League. Um, that's the only one that we've had um, a notification that they won't um, be rolling on um, for the last final two, three games, just due to play numbers. They're already pushing it and pulling players from everywhere. Um, to, to get that that team up and running, so you know, fairly fairly good um, response from the Coast League um, and their players. Look, I'm I'm still very surprised across the board um, in senior football that we have the teams still coming back and competing, even though you know they they have nothing to play for. It's it's 
you know, it's good to see that people obviously love the game. They want to play games. That's the most important part. But again, you're asking, you know, players to, to step in an environment where they've had five weeks off, haven't trained um, for two, three games that are meaningless, risk of injury, so on and so forth. So I know there are a few players here and there across teams that have said, no, I'm done for the year, um, depending on their situation. So um, for the large majority, though, they all came back uh, ready to go. I won't say fit and rearing, but um, <laughs> rearing to go, that's for sure. So this is my final question. Butters, how have you maintained the, the, the levels required for your side in this, in this time that we've had off? Um, look, I think it's just a matter of belief with my guys. They, they, they now believe that every time they step onto a football pitch that we're going to win the game. Um, you know, there's a good saying that, you know, good teams always find a way to win. And I think that this year we're, we're a good enough team that we can find a way to win against most teams. You know, even against Surface Paradise, we, we were down and we got that that late goal to keep that unbeaten run going. You know what I mean? I just I just think it's it's a mental thing. Um, our ability has never been questioned, like our technical ability of my players. It's just been in between the years sort of thing. And I can see it in their faces now that, you know, they expect to win every game, e even when it was 10 minutes to go against Burley on, on the weekend, I could see that they, they they expected to get a goal and expected to be in the in the finish at the end. And, you know, that, that that's what's happening. But, um, yeah, really good run. I think the reserve grade are pretty much uh, on the same sort of a run. So both squads haven't lost a game for close on 10 rounds now. So did you give your players individual work to do? Did you just leave them to their own devices and, and hope that uh, that their will to... to be in the side when they came back was going to get them through? Um, I th last year, the COVID break was actually good for us. M most of my players, and Alex is good friends with a lot of them, uh, will tell you that they they just naturally stay fit. They go to the gym three times a week. They're always surfing, doing stuff. Um, the first week of the lockdown, uh, or the first week when we were locked down, we'd done two 5K runs. So one on a Tuesday, one on a Thursday, where they had to register on Strava or one of the apps on their phone and then post it on Facebook. Um, the next two weeks, although we couldn't train on the field, I organised yoga and boxing sessions for them at the local gym. So they went down in shifts in groups of 10 down there. So, you know, they, they probably come back a little bit stronger than what they were before the break, but um, we're very rusty on the weekend. We're very rusty. We're like an under 15 Div 2 team at, at times with our passing. Um, so we've worked on that last night. We'll work on it again tomorrow. But no, my, my boys come back, you know, pretty, pretty fit. What about uh what about Tweed, Alex, with with everything that's happened with you guys? So we kind of um so at the start of the year, um we had a one of our young players had an unfortunate accident and um almost drowned off um the beach at Kulangata. So all our boys have all got together. Um and I've been doing a bring it for Bo, so supporting him and his recovery. So we've actually had a heap of our New South Wales boys all be putting on bring it for Bo shirts and, and hats and actually been doing 5K runs as much as possible and, you know, all getting together and, and trying to support a good cause. So while supporting a good cause, it's sort of probably helped them keep fit if there is a possibility of them, you know, being able to play if, if, if lockdown does lift. Um the Queensland boys, um, judging on training last week, I think a few of us might be a bit unfit, me included. Um, <laughs> obviously, yeah, I'm, I'm stuck living at my work at the moment, which is a bit unfortunate. But um, yeah, I think there's a few of us who probably could have done a little bit more in the in the in the lockdown period. But we're back in training and, and um, hopefully playing against the Legend boys. Hopefully, you know they're a bit slower and make it a bit a bit easier for us, which would be nice. <laughs> And Mark, I'll, uh, I won't throw you under the bus here, but I'll just a, a simple nod or a shake of the head. Did you see teams on the weekend where it was evident that they'd done nothing for the past five weeks? No, to be honest. Um, no, I just think it's all in our league. It's all repetition. I, I, I think generally the majority of the players, um, you know, they're not just some that just play football and nothing else. A lot of them do, as Brett said, do extra stuff. And it's pretty... You know, that's pretty, pretty evident. Um, you, can definitely, you can definitely see that 
in our league, especially if there's no football repetition and passing and the same old, those mistakes are just like, as Brett said, 15 div two, um, you know, just some of the defending and yeah, yeah, it was, it was, you know, you could tell, but you gave them a pass. Um, you gave them a pass because of the situation. Um, at least they're going out there. And again, you know, week one, and this is Steve McDonald said in his interview perfectly, week one, it's rust. Week two, you get better. Week three, you're sort of firing all cylinders and then you go into finals. He's got just the rust week and that's it for them. Yeah. So, and I can openly say it because I get along with all those boys and I love Steve's coaching, you know, how what he does and how he prepares his teams. They were really rusty on the weekend. So they were really rusty defensively, especially. Um, they'll always score goals. Um, but again, you know, for them now, it's about finding games, um, friendlies against absolutely anyone. Uh, because, you know, I said it on, the, on a, the podcast that I do, you can play in-house games all you like, but it's completely different. It's not the same as coming up against 11 other players that you don't um, see and don't play against. So, you know, I think hopefully for them, they can find a game, um, you know, just to get, get some reps up uh, before heading into finals. So the rest I have no concerns about. I think, you know, I'm not going to jump the gun, but I'm really looking forward to what should be the title decided next Saturday uh, evening at Narang, um, which I'm sure we'll talk about next week if everything goes to plan. Um, realistically, it's all in Narang's hands, if you want, like for a better word, because even if Surface do lose and Narang were to win, the title's still on the line there with a two-point gap. Um, the only way we won't see a title decided if Surface win on Friday night and Narang failed to get. Um, really, a point's not good enough because the goal difference, which everyone has clearly seen, is very far and beyond um so you know fingers crossed that we can at least end the season with a spectacle like that so it's all to play for business time in the gold coast premier league it's going to be always, fantastic all, always business here on the gold coast <laughs> <laughs> all right guys thank you so much for uh, your time this evening uh so alex delwell from tweet united thank you thank you darren uh, brett budwe Great to have you on board as per usual. Thanks, Darren. Anytime. Good stuff. And Mark, thanks again, as always. Pleasure. Thank you. All right. This has been the Village Law SEQFC Preview Show. We will see you next week.